Yo, what's going on everybody? Welcome back. Today we're going to wrap up our complete draft grades here. We're a little bit past the draft hype here, so this video is coming a little late, but I did want to get these thoughts and opinions out here before the draft hype completely faded away. So again, just the ground rules here, grading on a somewhat of a tough scale here. So a C is actually a pretty solid grade, just means, you know, I thought the pick was fine. They built a need, got you know, not terrible value, whatever. Uh, basically just do this so that the B's and A's really differentiate themselves so you can see which picks I thought are really good and have potential to be really solid impacts for these teams. And then point B here is we are going off of my personal draft grades, the evaluations I had on these players coming into the draft. So you'll see my value on these guys. That's the primary focus of the grade itself. The value is my own draft evaluations. Obviously everyone has their own opinions and I respect your opinions, but you know, where I had a guy going definitely might not correlate with where guys like Kuiper and McShay and the mass majority of people really have these guys. So this is really my job to just try and project who I think has perhaps a better chance of being a good pick, whether it's a steal or maybe a, a bad pick in the other direction where I think they took a guy too early and they're gonna regret not going uh, with something else. And while I understand that it's impossible to project how good all these guys are you know these are my opinions in the past i feel like i've done a pretty good job kind of laying out some potential great values and that's what i'm trying to do here is just project what i think these rookies are going to look like here uh, not just in the first year but really for their career and then for those that are wondering i know the questions are coming uh, left and right here the playstation roster is pretty much done i've got about 10 picks left by the time you watch this video the entire seventh round should be in there. I'll add a, a few undrafted free agents, but I'm pretty much out of players to add. Um, so I did want to throw that in here. And again, guys, if you want to contribute for my work on that roster, uh, do consider heading over to my Patreon in the description or uh, just a donation on PayPal. Goes much longer than you could ever imagine. I really appreciate the support. So let's get into the AFC grades here. We're going to hammer through the entire AFC. I'd imagine this video might get a little long, but uh, you know, I wanted to get this done here and really tie a ribbon on the NFL draft here and start looking forward to this offseason, doing some deep dives into teams, start talking about projections, talk some fantasy football, do some Madden rebuilds uh, and get into some fun stuff this summer. So without further ado, we're going to start here with the Cleveland Browns. Won't spend too much time on Baker Mayfield, but I will reiterate the points that I've made that I thought this was an atrocity of a pick here. I have all the respect in the world for Elliot Wolf and John Dorsey there uh, taking care of this team, but this just seems like more of the same to me. You know, the obvious pick to me was Sam Darnold, the clear cut number one quarterback on my board. You know, Baker, I've compared him to Case Keenum throughout this entire process. I'm going to stick with that. So could he come in and be a quality starting quarterback, win some games? Absolutely. But to pass up on true elite potential talent, when in my opinion, you have the surrounding core to take a bigger swing at a guy like Donald or even Josh Allen. You know, I get that this team has missed time and time again, but in the scheme of things, four or five years down the road, yeah, you might win a few more games up front, but when you get stuck in a potential QB purgatory with Baker Mayfield that I think you could end up in, it's just not worth it, especially at the first overall pick in the draft. He's got a good, not great arm. He's very accurate. Uh, his mobility was great in college, but he proved that he is not a great athlete, not just at the combine and the underwear Olympics, but when he played actual NFL talent, watch the Georgia game. He tries to do a lot of the same things he could do against big 12 defenders playing in that pillow fight conference. And it just didn't work when he goes deep. It's inconsistent by what I was watching. You know, I get that the analytics say that he was actually a very deep thrower, but the balls themselves just you know, from my analysis of the film, I don't see him being an elite downfield thrower. I think he's going to be like a Case Keenum, game manager type. But when the game's on the line, the talent is just going to cost him some games like it did with Case Keenum in the playoffs last year. Uh, and then at 1.4, this was a pretty bad pick too. You know, Denzel Ward could be a great corner. And, you know, if he does turn out to be that, then this pick, I guess, isn't that bad. But Bradley Chubb, man, to pair him with Miles Garrett, uh, just have an elite edge rushing duo paired with what could have been an elite franchise quarterback. I think the Browns really butchered this draft. You know, 2.1, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.
They get uh, Austin Corbett, who's going to be a versatile, really solid lineman. I liked this pick. Played tackle in college. He's projected more as a guard, but they're pretty set at guard, and they're going to have some good competition to tackle. So I like the idea of bringing in some more talent there. And then the Nick Chubb pick was great. You know, when I was projecting this team to go Darnold and Chubb uh, with one and four, big point of doing that I was saying back then was that you can get a Nick Chubb if you pass on Saquon Barkley is what I'm talking about you can get a Nick Chubb who's a very talented running back here in the second round thought he was underrated thought there was running backs that went ahead of him that were not as good as Chubb and then uh, they take Chad Thomas in the third you know fine looking back at it if you flipped 1.4 and 3.3 you take Chubb at 1.4 and then at 3.3 if you could have taken Isaac Yadam or uh, a corner that went all the way in the sixth round that I thought was fantastic, Christian Campbell. I'd be much more excited about this defense. It's just hard to make an impact right away at that corner position. And Chad Thomas, he's kind of just an average talent on the edge. And then 4.5, they take Antonio Callaway. I didn't love this pick. You know, most teams, I would say, great pick if you could put him in a good locker room. And this is pretty much the same thing that John Dorsey did with Tyreek Hill in Kansas City, but that was a much better locker room. You're pairing him with Josh Gordon, who's a troublemaker, and just a team that's not going to be as well equipped to handle off the field issues like you're getting with Callaway. Um, but there's no denying the talent is there. And then they take an athletic linebacker, another receiver prospect who I don't see making this team, and then a six foot four project corner here uh, in the sixth round that was not on my board. Uh, so, really, nothing exciting in my opinion after the Chubb pick. I really think Cleveland did a bad job on capitalizing on value in this draft, which has been really the downfall of this organization over the last, what, 30 years? You know, that's how you build your core of a good team is by capitalizing on the value in the draft, filling out the margins with pieces that you probably shouldn't be able to get. And I don't see a whole lot of that here with this draft. So I gave it a D minus, and I would be very disappointed if I was a Browns fan. All right, that got a little long. We're going to try and speed up here. I want to spend a little extra time with Cleveland because they were a big draft. But uh, let's move on to the Bengals here. A fine draft. Nothing really totally stood out to me. You know, they take Billy Price in the first round, and this was just a home run. It, really, the whole move was great because you get Cordy Glenn, you get your starting left tackle, and you get a really quality starting center. This team let the line fall apart, and the team fell apart with it. So they're really trying to get back to having that good offensive line because you can have all the weapons in the world, which this team does, but without that offensive line, it's not going to click, especially when you've got a, a system quarterback like Andy Dalton. And then they take Jesse Bates, a safety I like uh, in a class that didn't have a lot of really refined center fielders. They get one in Jesse Bates. I like their safeties Cincinnati, but they don't really have that center fielder. So now they have three good safeties there with Ioka and Williams and Ioka might actually be an odd man out here. He's got a pretty decent contract after getting extended and he has not lived up to that contract. So maybe this offers them a way to replace Ioka at the free safety spot. Then they get good value with Sam Hubbard, just pairing him uh, with a, a really good group of D linemen, Carl Lawson. And then we already know about what you're getting from Geno Atkins and Carlos Dunlap. This defense is going to be back and pretty good. They got a bit of an underrated defense just from the secondary all the way through. They add Malik Jefferson here in the third round, who I was a little lower on, but there's no denying he could come in and be a starting linebacker. They also signed Preston Brown, the tackle machine from Buffalo. So they're trying to get a little more athletic in that linebacking group that's been a liability. They take Mark Walton here in the fourth. I don't know how you don't go John Kelly. I, I guess the league did not have the same opinion I had on John Kelly as a second, third round prospect. Walton's fine. I don't see a huge upside there. I do like Joe Mixon anyway. Uh, and then uh, Devontae Harris, Andrew Brown, Darius Phillips. None of these picks really stood out to me, but you're filling out the margins of that defense. Logan Woodside, I thought was a great pick way at the end of the draft. You know, he definitely has that Case Keenum profile, smaller guy, but willing to sling it, uh, whether or not it translates to the next level, it's up in the air, but I just like his game a lot. You get a good backup here to replace AJ McCarron, um, but I wouldn't be, you know, totally stunned if he challenged Andy Dalton. I don't think Woodside's the long time answer here, but I like just getting Woodside in that quarterback room that is pretty lacking right now. They take Rod Taylor in the seventh, good pick, just a massive, 
human to try and move the, the the line forward there. That run game really struggled. And then Auden Tate, I've been really low on this entire process. I've said slower Kelvin Benjamin, who I'm already extremely low on. Um, not going to say I'm glad to see him fall to the seventh round. I, you know, I wouldn't wish that on anyone, but you know, it's good to see the league uh, reflecting my opinion on Auden Tate. I don't see him making this team. So I gave the Bengals a B. You know, I think they're going to improve that offensive line, which is huge. Should be able to become much more competitive on offense. And they added some pretty good depth here on the defensive side of the ball. Potentially got a starting free safety in the mix. Nothing crazy here, but just a good solid draft. A lot of picks to get into the mix here for the Bengals. And then the Ravens. A lot of people were extremely high on this draft. I think it had highs and lows. After the first two days, it was looking more like an A, but then on day three, I really don't think they got a lot of value, and I think they even butchered a few picks. Obviously, that could change in the long run, but just uh, some picks we'll talk about here in a second. But Hayden Hurst was fine. I was really low on this tight end class. I think Hurst is a good tight end, but he's overaged. He could absolutely become Hunter Henry, but Hunter Henry took three years to get there. If that happens with Hayden Hurst, he's going to be 28 by the time he's a quality starting tight end. And this is a first round pick we're talking about. Uh, but I loved the Lamar Jackson pick. Uh, and this is almost just a gut feeling. You know, I, I like Lamar Jackson's game. I had him as my fourth quarterback and a first round talent. So they get value here. Uh, but it's perfect because he can sit and learn. I love the culture in Baltimore. They always seem to do a good job developing players, it seems like. Um, but they don't always have a talent like Lamar Jackson. So I'm really excited. He's going to look great in a Ravens jersey. I wouldn't be surprised at all if he's starting by week 10 for this Ravens team. Uh, but the biggest thing here was just to get some excitement pumped into this offense and get these guys something to be you know, really excited about the future of this team. And I think they did that with Jackson. Brown, uh, the tackle going in the third round was fine. You know, he could very well start at right tackle. There's a lot of questions about his athleticism and how he's going to serve as a pass protector if he needs to convert and become an oversized guard. Uh, so there's definitely some questions there, but there was a good value for Brown there. And then they doubled down on tight ends, taking Mark Andrews, who was really not too far behind Hayden Hurst on my board. It's definitely a position that helps Joe Flacco out a lot. He is definitely best when he's had tight ends. And they got their first and second best tight ends in the roster now on this or uh, in this draft rather than Anthony Averett. They take in the fourth round. You knew Baltimore had to get an Alabama player. So they load in there and then Kenny Young, athletic, but uh, unimpressive linebacker for me on tape. And then these next two picks were the ones that I kind of thought were, were really bad. Jaleel Scott, oversized, the ceiling of Brandon Coleman. He's 6'6", 215. Just doesn't move well at all. And it passed up on Jamon Moore, who I was extremely high on. There was a bunch of really talented receivers that somehow fell in this class. A lot of them we'll talk about throughout this video. But I thought this was an absolute reach when there was extraordinary talent sitting there. And the same thing goes for Jordan Lassley, who a lot of people were high on. You know, for me, it just seemed like he was Rosen's guy, but he never really showed me a whole lot that's going to translate to him being a, a plus starter or anything and he's got off the field issues uh, so I've heard so I didn't like either of those receivers I would not be surprised at all uh, after all the signings this team's made if neither of these two made the roster it was not very high on either of these guys and then they take Deshaun Elliott who a lot of people are excited about you know there always seems to be some extra allure to Texas players but when you throw on his film, it's it's fine. He's not an elite athlete. He's not an uber playmaker. He's just seems to be another guy to me. I don't think he's a starter in this league. And then they take uh, Sanat, an athletic tackle project. Bradley Bozeman, another Alabama center here to fill out the margins of that depth. And Zach Zeeler, a DN that I didn't evaluate. So like I said, really good day one and two. Just absolute spark plugs for that offense. The defense is going to be fine. This Ravens team... Never struggles with defense, uh, but I wasn't really big on anything that happened for this team on day three. Uh, but if they hit on those first four picks, it's not really going to matter. Uh, but I think this was a really deep class, rounds four through six, and this team didn't really find anyone in that round, in my opinion. All right, and then the Steelers, who reached for Terrell Edmonds here at 128. Item has a fifth-round prospect. Most people had him third to fifth round. 
you know, he could turn out. He's super athletic, smart guy. Um, but it's really just about the fact that I think this team could have maximized the value, whether it was trading down, getting more picks. They only had seven, or they only walked away with seven anyway. Um, they don't get a corner in this class, which I see as a pretty big need for this team. And there were good corners that went in the later rounds. So, you know, I think you still could have gotten Terrell Edmonds uh, and, and maximized the value of that pick by moving down. And then 228, James Washington, just another second round stud receiver potentially for the Steelers. I love James Washington's game. I think he's Victor Cruz going to play in the slot. And Juju Smith-Schuster is another good comparison for James Washington. Just that big physical body, potentially the best hands in this class. I'm sure he's going to turn out to be a pretty good player here down the road. Maybe not right away, though. And then 328, they take Mason Rudolph. Awesome pick. You know, I wasn't the biggest Mason Rudolph guy, but I had a second round grade on him. And he really shows at times those flashes of Big Ben. It's not just the frame, but he's got a pretty similar style to him as well. He, he's got a, an extremely accurate arm downfield at times. He'll, he'll miss at other times, but he has those some of the best just floaters that just drop in right in stride 40 yards downfield. I also like the idea that you're pairing him with James Washington here, his college teammate. Is he the quarterback of the future? I think he'll get a chance, and I'd, I'd give him a 15 to 20 percent chance of being this team's next franchise quarterback, which is pretty good in the, in the third round here. And then they take a, a project tackle here, a core four, and then Marcus Allen, a safety I really liked. I actually had a higher grade on Marcus Allen than I did on Edmonds. We'll see if uh, that comes to fruition. Probably not. Usually teams will go to the guy they've invested in. Jalen Samuels, kind of an exciting H-back, fullback, tight end, halfback, receiver, hybrid, flex combo guy. Uh, they've clearly got a plan for what they want to do with him. And then uh, Josh Fraser, kind of a Project D tackle out of Alabama. So I gave this draft a C+. Plus. I think they could have done more, but I do like how they've set up for the future with Rudolph and Washington. Next up, we've got the Bills, who I'm going to get flack for giving them an A- minus here uh, because I am kind of a Josh Allen guy. I, I didn't think I was before this draft process started. You know, I like him. He shows a lot of flashes, frankly, more flashes than I think people are willing to give him credit for. He has elite traits. He's got great pocket awareness and elite accuracy, uh, especially on the run. But down the field, he throws as good a ball as anyone. People knock him for missing on the short ball. Some of his mechanics are off. That's stuff that, for me, is coachable. And in a good culture with a good system is very much developable, if that's a word. Um, but I thought the value was here. I had a top five grade on Josh Allen. So many people just hate him. I, I'm higher on him. People are going to disagree, and that's fine. That's the beauty of the draft. And then at 116, they take Tremaine Edmonds, who is an extraordinary talent. This team needed a linebacker. That was a slam dunk pick at a great value and a big need. And then 332, this might be my favorite pick out of all of them, Harrison Phillips. Fits the culture of Buffalo. If you go back to my seven-round mock, I really... You know, I did the bills and I really just hammered away on guys that I thought were going to be great culture fits here. That's definitely what this team is built on and how they had so much success last year is they got people who are going to buy in to Doug McDermott and that culture there. Definitely Harrison Phillips. He's going to learn from Kyle Williams, whose days are numbered and ultimately become this team's best interior defender, in my opinion, for the next 10, 12 years. They take Teron Johnson, a corner I liked, but kind of a nickel guy. That I thought fourth was a little earlier for him. Um, Siren Neal, guy that not a lot of people know about from Jacksonville State, but a super athlete. And, you know, when I saw him rated, you know, fourth, fifth round, I assumed he would have some pretty raw tape, but I dialed it up. He's super instinctive, smart guy. He plays, you know, that nickel corner, strong safety, money backer role and just killed it as a senior. So I think he's going to be a great fit. You know, their two safeties here are more cover guys, and Sarah Neal gives them a more impact in the box as a safety. So I like what they'll be able to do with him in this scheme. Wyatt Teller, great pick here, probably going to start at guard for this team. And then they take Ray May, Ray, Ray McLeod here as the first really skill player to help out Josh Allen. That's my criticism of this draft is they didn't do a whole lot uh, to help Josh Allen. So I'm kind of hoping that they're going to sit Josh Allen for the year and just let Peterman and uh, AJ McCarron 
carry the season out. Um, if they're honest about it, you know, yeah, they made the playoffs last year, but I don't think this is a playoff team again this year. I think they sit Josh Allen. Just let the other guys compete and, and just let Allen learn and then use next year's draft and free agency to really put a good offensive line and receivers around Allen. Because as much as I like him, there's definitely risk involved with Josh Allen. They got to get this right. They gave up a ton of assets to go get him. Uh, no need to rush it. You're not winning the Super Bowl this year, Buffalo. Uh, so take take their time. And I, I think that's what they're going to do. But so many times we see teams rush that quarterback in there. So we'll see how that all plays out. Austin Prohl, slot receiver out of UNC to play underneath. Uh, so I liked the draft. They've still got work to do. Um, but really those first three picks I think were excellent and exactly what Buffalo needed. So moving on to the Dolphins, really good draft here. Minka Fitzpatrick, they stuck true to their board. And the Dolphins had a really terrible offseason, in my opinion, just a bunch of random moves that didn't really make a lot of sense. But this draft made sense. They wanted to get more athletic on defense. They spent two of their top three picks doing that. I liked the Jerome Baker pick in the third round. Pair him with his former teammate there, Raekwon McMillan at linebacker. So between Fitzpatrick and Baker, you're going to have some really good instinctive fast flying defenders there both are great against the run Fitzpatrick is he a safety for this team is he a corner everyone's got him charted in as a safety there um we'll see I I still think he can play corner I've been saying it this whole process it's probably where he would best fit on this Dolphins defense we'll see what they end up doing with him it's probably going to be safety but if I were them I would give him a shot at corner and then move him to safety I don't see a whole lot of risk in doing that I uh, like the Gasicki pick in the second round just to get kind of a high upside impact player uh, with potential there. They take a good run blocking tight end in Durham Smythe. And then I've been a huge Kalen Balaj guy. I think he is the best running back on that roster. I like what they have in Kenyon Drake, but he's a more slender guy. I see Drake down the road as more of a third down back. I know he had a very good year. And Dolphins fans might not like that I said that, um, but I think Kalen Balaj too, is just a great talent and offers a physical element to this run game that this team was missing last year that I think they were trying to add when they signed Frank Gore. A lot of times you see power backs can inspire an offensive line to block better. That's what the steel Seahawks lineman always used to say about Marshawn Lynch. I think Kalen Balaj is going to offer that element of the, the run game to this team. And then I don't really have much to say about the rest of this draft, but a good solid draft. Loved the Fitzpatrick pick. This team needed impact players in the secondary, and they got it. Jerome Baker's going to fly around and make some plays as well. Going to be an underrated defense next year. Not sure how the offense is going to be, uh, but the Dolphins definitely got a lot better from this draft. Uh, then the Jets here. Now, Sam Darnold, probably the best pick in the draft. You get the best quarterback, the player that I thought should have been the first overall pick. No brainer. Uh, they get him at three, and they thought they might be looking at the third best quarterback in this class, and they get the best one. Um, so if he turns out to be their franchise quarterback, just ignore the B-plus grade and ignore the rest of the picks. Nothing else matters if he is as good as he could be. Uh, the only reason I didn't give this grade an A is I don't think they did a whole lot with the rest of their draft to help out Sam Darnold. They didn't really, well, they didn't at all draft any linemen and, or receivers. They had Chris Herndon in the fifth round, but I think that's just another dart throw at an athletic tight end that doesn't have a lot of finesse. And they have 17 receivers on this roster, but I don't see a single number one in that group. You could have had some really high upside picks here like Jamon Moore. They could have had a chance at uh, Michael Gallup, I'm pretty sure, in the third round there. Uh, so I, I definitely question what they did with the rest of their draft. Uh, and you know what this draft actually really reminds me of is when the Colts got Andrew Luck. And I know I've sort of compared Sam Darnold to Andrew Luck. I don't think he's as good of a prospect as Luck was, but I, don't, I do think Darnold is the best prospect since Andrew Luck at quarterback. Um, but if you go back and look at the Colts drafts a few years after they took Luck, uh, maybe even the, the year they took Luck, really didn't do a whole lot to help Luck out. So could have definitely done more. I do like Nathan Shepard in, in the third, but I had a fourth round grade on him. He's, he's a little older, uh, but again, if Sam Darnold turns out, none of that's going to matter. Uh, so then we got the Patriots here. Tough to uh, sit here and question Bill Belichick. Um, but there were some questions I had in this draft. So I like the Isaiah Wynn pick. It looks like he's going to play tackle. They seem to think he can do it, even though he's short. He's got long arms and did a, a really good job of it at Georgia. Uh, so I'm not going to doubt that he can. 
maybe down the road he switches to guard. Um, but I like that pick. Never against loading up on uh, just maulers. And that's what Isaiah Wynn is. Uh, and then Sonny Michelle here at 131. Gets a D because of a, I'm going to stay true to my board. And I will stand by that I think there are a lot of running backs better than Sony Michelle in this class. That said, A, I'm not going to question Bill Belichick's eye for running backs, but you know, you can't deny that this is a great fit for a running back who is very talented. Yes, I had him third to fifth round, but this was an incredible running back class. In other classes, I could have had easily a second, maybe even first to second round grade on Michelle. Uh, so I, while I question the value, I think Michelle's going to be a stud here. Bill Belichick has never, ever invested in a running back like this. I'm pretty sure he instantly becomes the highest paid running back that has ever played for uh, at least the Tom Brady regime. Patriots fans can uh, spot me on that one, but it sounds right. I just drafted Sony Michelle in my Dynasty rookie draft. I think he's going to be really productive. Do we look back on it five years and say, okay, maybe there was other players that would have been a much better pick there, even if Michelle was good? Maybe. I think that's likely. That's why I gave it a D. Um, but, you know, I think he's going to be a very productive running back for this team. And then 224, I love Duke Dawson. He gives them a more athletic version of Malcolm Butler, Logan Ryan, a really, really damn good nickel corner at Florida. Could potentially play outside, but he's just that run defending prototype that Bill Belichick likes uh, as a second corner there. And then take a couple linebackers here. I put the Christian Sam pick in my worst picks video because Luke Falk was still available. You had just grabbed another similar prospect in my opinion in Jawan Bentley. Uh, why take another linebacker who I had a priority grade on when you can grab Luke Falk who is just inspired to all hell by Tom Brady. I had a very high grade on Luke Falk. He could have been the future for this team. I don't think that's Danny Etling at all. I don't know what they saw in Danny Etling, to be honest, and he's their backup now, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so that was really kind of a head scratcher. That's a big reason I have a C plus here and this grade's not in the Bs. Um, but the Braxton Berrios pick, a total Bill Belichick move. You get your, your crafty gritty, all the Sunday night football adjectives you hear for those those slot receivers for the Patriots, uh, the white slot receiver. And Braxton Berrios could just be the next Julian Edelman and very well might be. And then I like the croissant pick as a total special teams impact. Go to his draft scout profile, just a total freak. And then Ryan Izzo as a depth tight end player. So I have my questions about this Patriots draft. They usually just kind of do their own thing, stick true to their board. They definitely did that. Um, but as an outsider, I certainly had my own questions about it. All right, moving on to the AFC South, which I think is going to be a sneakily competitive division next year. I loved this Colts draft, at least at the top here. Uh, Quentin Nelson, just a slam dunk pick. This team just needed some enforcers up front, and they got another one in Braden Smith in the second round, who is a bit of a sleeper in this class. Big, strong guy, really good athlete. These two guys will be their starting guards uh, for the next 10 years. I feel pretty confident in saying that the, the Leonard pick I questioned, um, he's he was fine to me on tape. You know, he's not an uber athlete. He's got the ideal size. I wanted to see more from him at his level of competition, more dominance, and I just didn't see it. He could definitely turn out to be a good linebacker for this team that needs them. And Leonard was probably the highest upside, true middle linebacker, run defense, coverage guy. As far as potential goes, he was probably the, the best guy available at this time. Um, so not a terrible pick by any means, but I just thought there was a lot of value other places. Um, but then the Kamoku Toure pick, I love. I've been hearing a lot of people say he's a raw edge rusher. I actually love his tape. I think he's got a lot of finesse to his game. Really good athlete. Going to compete to be that complimentary edge rusher to uh, Jabal Sheard, who's been really good for this Colts team. Extremely underratedly good for this Colts team. So the front seven getting a huge boost. They take Tyquan Lewis as well here at the end of the second round, who they clearly like. <clears throat> I was a little lower on him, but... Uh, it could definitely be an impact here as well. So I really like just kind of loading up on the the beef of this team, trying to become um, more imposing, the, the team that gets off the bus and, you know, scares the other team a little bit. They didn't have that that enforcement factor 
uh, then they definitely helped that out here. And then later in the draft, I like a lot of these things they did here. So Naheem Hines gives this team a receiving threat out of the backfield that they've really been missing. I want to say in the entire Andrew Luck era, I was a little lower on Hines than I think some people, but you can't deny he's got a ton of upside as receiving threat receiver. Don't think he's ever going to be a threat between the tackles. Doris Fountain, who just stunned people at his UNI Pro Day because his tape is fantastic. He's one of the better route runners in this class. He's one of the better uh, hands guys, jump ball guys. And then he comes out with like a 43-inch vertical, huge broad jump of good 40, proves that he is an elite athlete. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if a year from now, Doris Fountain is the number one receiver uh, for this Colts team, given how they use T.Y. Hilton as that smaller guy a lot of times uh, in the slot. Um, he's an outside threat as well, but Fountain has the mold of your ideal number one receiver with size and speed. So definitely a guy I'm intrigued by. And then Jordan Wilkins. I don't know how you take him when John Kelly is still available. That's why I gave this pick a D. Other picks as well, like Justin Jackson and a, a really a plethora of really good running backs. Jordan Wilkins is just a almost like a fullback to me. He's, he's slower. He's a good runner, but he's never going to be a starting running back. He just doesn't have the physical upside, uh, but he's safe with the ball. He's got good hands. He's going to be able to block for you on third downs. So I get it. You know, kind of reminds me of like a Mike Tolbert who has value in this league. And it's not like you need to hit a home run, but the Colts honestly kind of do. And there's a lot of high upside running backs like John Kelly available here that would have just been I would have been ecstatic about uh John Kelly on the Colts I would have almost gone as far as saying that John Kelly might be as productive as Saquon Barkley in his rookie year with this Colts team that's mainly a reflection of Andrew Luck and just it's a bigger piece of the pie uh, but that's a lot of time to talk on a, a theoretical situation let's move on Dion Kane talented average um you know balanced receiver here to get him in the sixth round was excellent i'm starting to like the value they found at receiver late in this draft a lot of teams capitalized on some outstanding talent that fell in this draft you know i think of the cowboys and the packers those teams stand out uh, for really recognizing some good receiver talent unlike i've ever seen falling into the sixth and seventh round here uh, and then they take matthew adams a super athletic linebacker uh, so is Zare Franklin I'm trying to get faster in that linebacking group not sure if either of those guys will make the team but they have a chance uh, so I like the Colts draft uh, there were spots where they could have done better but uh, you know they definitely improved just filling out this team that really needed everything and they got some good value at a lot of spots moving on to the Jags uh, they take Taven Bryan in the first two I'm a big Taven Bryan guy I think he's a good fit here he's not going to play a ton right away but I think they're looking down the road a little bit at some cap issues. They're probably not going to be able to keep Darius and Malik Jackson long term. Maybe they will. Uh, but Taven Bryan offers them just uh, depth and talent on that already strong D-line. Uh, the only reason I didn't love this pick is Lamar Jackson on the Jags would have gotten me excited for this team. Like, I'm talking about like Super Bowl excited. Uh, it's not a secret that I'm not a Blake Bortles fan. Uh, they had an opportunity to get away from that Blake Bortles situation that is, I think, going to, as good as this defense is, I don't think they're ever going to win a Super Bowl with this team as long as Blake Bortles is their quarterback. And they had an opportunity here to potentially overwrite that, and they failed on that. Um, so that is a big part of this grade here. Um, but, you know, I like Taven Bryan. I, I didn't shred the, the pick. Uh, I think they are just way too high on Blake Bortles, much higher than they should be. And then DJ Chark, just the draft hype guy that I am not buying into. They've got a ton of receivers. They had other needs. Really didn't like this pick. He's a speed guy, but it doesn't show on film. His hands are fine. I had Jamon Moore as a similar type of player, but just way more physical, way better at the point of catch. Equinemius St. Brown is another guy like that. Um, just did not like this pick. And then uh, I like their next two, Ronnie Harrison, great value for uh, a backup safety for now, but uh, a guy that is pretty much the replacement for Barry Church, who's getting older, similar player, Ronnie Harrison. So I like that pick. Will Richardson, just good value for an offensive tackle in this class. And he's got upside, but he's also, you know, almost ready to play right away, I would say. 
I would say he competes for a starting tackle job on this team. They're not going to give up on Robinson yet at left tackle, but he did not have a good year in pass pro last year. Uh, so this could pr uh, provide a way to get out of that. Tanner Lee in the sixth, whatever. Leon Jacobs, super high potential pick here. Just a uh, lead of the elite athletes here, Leon Jacobs. I wouldn't be surprised if he converts to sort of that... 4-3 outside blitzer coverage guy, sort of the Anthony Barr role. They draft him as an edge player. They've got a lot of talent on that D-line. So I could see Jacobs slipping out and becoming a stand-up linebacker down the road so fast. Offers a lot of upside and coverage, and then they take a punter. Um, so a fine draft for the Jags. You know, they, they hit some needs, but I don't think they did anything in this draft that's really changing the landscape of this team this year or too much for their future. It was just a fine draft. If they could have gotten their hands on Lamar Jackson, this would have been an A++ grade. Then we got the Texans, whose grade is really contingent on Deshaun Watson being as good as he showed in his short time last year before getting hurt. Because if he's that good, doesn't matter. He gave up a first round pick and I believe a second round pick in this draft as well. I'm not sure where that second round went towards. I'm pretty sure it was towards Watson. Um, but yeah, you don't pick till the third round, but then you get a, a first round caliber prospect, in my opinion, and Justin Reed at a position of need. Uh, so great pick there. And Justin Reed can really play any starting position for this Texans team. You know, they say they're going to play Tyron Matthew at free safety. Okay. I seems like a wasted uh, value there for t what Tyron Matthew does in the nickel, but uh, Justin Reed could play free, free safety, strong safety. So great pick there. Then they take Martinez Rankin, who's a versatile lineman. I like what they're doing, signing versatile linemen here. They bring in uh, Zach Fulton. This line was an atrocity last year, so they're really trying to fill that starting lineup out. Uh, Martinez Rankin might get in the mold there. Jordan Aikens, this was a reach for me. Undersized, tight end. I compare him to Brandon Bostic. You know, um, didn't make a ton of sense because I thought Steven Anderson is a similar player who actually showed success already at the NFL level. So I didn't love that pick at all. Uh, but then they take Kiki Kuti, who I'm not really high on, but it's a great fit here. Hometown opportunity here, keeping him in the state. But they really need some help on this receiving core. They really tried to get uh, Ellington going at the slot. It's That's not ideal. So you get Ki, uh, Kiki Kuti to contribute there and potentially start in the slot. Really great player with the ball in his hands. Kind of a poor man's Tavon Austin, which isn't saying a whole lot, I know. But uh, anyway, Duke Ejiofor was one of the best values in this class. This reminds me so, so much of Carl Lawson last year, who fell in the draft because of injury concerns. I, at one point, had a first-round grade on Ejiofor. I don't know when and how he's going to play, on this team with all these edge rushers, but Houston was like, screw it. He's a hell of a player. I don't know why he was still there in the sixth round. If he gets an opportunity, I think Duke Edgefor is gonna be a monster in this league. Uh, just needs to stay healthy. And then 637, Jordan Thomas. And then they take uh, an edge rusher in Columbia and Jermaine Kelly. None of these guys I had evaluated. Um, so we'll see if they turn into anything as a uh, day three guys there but really good draft for the texans again it's boosted by the deshaun watson pick seemingly being a good investment for this team but a couple picks of excellent value uh, and then the titans here just four picks and you see some of these teams that have 11 picks and you're like well where'd they get all these picks well apparently the titans gave all of them away um, but it worked out i loved these four picks um and it's it's fitting for this team because i have been saying really going back to last fall that this Titans team might be the deepest team in the league. They have a bunch of really solid starters. They don't have any true holes. They had a couple, but they hit those early in this draft with good players. Uh, what they need is impact guys, superstar potential players. Rashawn Evans, really good middle linebacker. I don't know if he's a superstar, like I just said, but they needed a middle linebacker to come in and start. And he's a damn good one. And then Harold Landry. You could make the argument this is the best pick in the draft. I certainly think it's right there with Derwin James. Um, this team, I thought their biggest need was edge rush. Because uh, it's a defense that, you know, wasn't consistent enough. Forcing turnovers, which is how you become an elite defense. They have good pieces, but they need that guy that can just get to the quarterback, 
you know, Jarrell Casey's good, but he's an interior guy. It's hard to do it consistently from there. Arakpo is getting older. You've got uh, Morgan there. But Harold Landry, baby Von Miller here. I don't know how he slipped to the second round, and I have 41 written there. That's not right. I think that's supposed to be 08. Uh, so sorry about that. But just a great, great pick here for Harold Landry. I think he's going to take the job from Derek Morgan and be a huge impact for this Titans team. Does it turn into a playoff showing in this good division? Does it really contribute to this defense elevating? We'll see, um, but definitely in the, in the right direction there. Dane Cruikshank, they take, it, who's a super high upside defensive back, probably the long-term strong safety here. He's good in the nickel as well. Um, you know, needs to develop a little bit, but just a freaky athlete. Could be really nice to pair him with Bayard on this team. And then I love the Luke Falk pick, you know, Mariota is the franchise here, but he has he had some hiccups and I'm not saying anything's going to happen to Mariota. And I think he is actually going to develop pretty well under, you know, finally getting a modern offensive mind in there to work with him. So I, I think Mariota is still the future here, but this is incredible value for Luke Falk, who I had as the fifth ranked quarterback ahead of Baker Mayfield. I think he is the ideal system quarterback, has a great processor, great release. He's extremely accurate. And he even has some mobility to his game. So, you know, maybe this is one of those situations where they flip him into a second round pick. Maybe Mariota, who does like to run, suffers an injury and misses a few weeks and Luke Falk gets to shine. And then they ship him off as basically an investment in three years and just get a second, maybe even a first round pick for him. So I just think that's an excellent value pick there. And they could have used a backup quarterback as well. I know they signed uh, somebody. I can't remember who it was. Gabbert, maybe. Um, but it's Falk now. We're towards the end here, we got the Broncos who knocked it out of the park. Uh, you know, I knew it was going to be either the Redskins or the Broncos who I gave the highest grade to in this draft. And I think it's the Broncos, to be honest. Um, you look at those first seven picks. Incredible value. Um, it's a good team. It's a team that... Won a lot of games before they kind of fell apart due to injury and, and poor quarterback play. But this team will be back and they will compete, not just for the playoffs, but for a Super Bowl this season. I'm very confident in that. This defense will be back. The offense is going to be better. They got a ton of weapons now and an upgraded quarterback, even though I'm not a huge Case Keenum guy. Um, but Chubb, slam dunk. No one's going to want to play this defense. Are you kidding me? Chubb and Von Miller. Forget about it. Uh, it's a better combination than when they had DeMarcus Ware still at the back end of his prime with Von Miller. And that's why those defenses were so great. So just to get back to that, and you know, a, a comparison for Chubb is DeMarcus Ware. So just an amazing pick. They couldn't write enough thank you notes to Cleveland for letting him fall here. Uh, and then Cortland Sutton in the second round, just a great value. They don't need him right now. But their receivers are older, and Sutton, who's actually a good comparison, is Demarius Thomas. So just gets to learn there. Maybe in a year or two, he steps in as the number one for this team. He was the number one receiver on my board. Uh, Freeman in the third here, good pick. He's uh, a pretty similar player to C.J. Anderson, except for potentially a, an actually healthy C.J. Anderson. So that's a good pick. I think he's going to be the starter here. Never been a huge Booker guy. I like Henderson, but Freeman's really the potential you know three down back here for this team then Isaac Yudum corner I love out of Boston College who I thought could have gone early second round they get him at the end of the third round to replace Aqib Talib yeah great pick Josie Jewell super instinctive smart linebacker not a great athlete not good in coverage but he's going to help this run defense a lot uh, playing on first and second down Deshaun Hamilton extraordinary value they've got Two players that are very similar to Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders. I think Deshaun Hamilton is a very similar player to Emmanuel Sanders, so that's a great pick. And then Troy Fumagalli in the fifth, a great run blocker at worst, but not a bad receiver by any means. And then you load up uh, on a backup center here. You take a, a linebacker here that uh, out of Washington that I was pretty indifferent on. And then David Williams, a running back uh, who I didn't evaluate, just kind of a power back. May or may not make the team, probably will not. Uh, but yeah, just value across the board. And that's what I talk about in these classes is just, just, you know, maybe not always drafting for need, but just 
hammer away at great picks left and right. And that's what they did here. Just got a ton of great players to come in and compete. And I love it. And then the Chargers here who had, in my opinion, the best pick in the draft because I love this Chargers team already, their roster. Um, but they did have just a big need in that you know, last level of the defense. Derwin James, the best safety in this class, a can't miss prospect in my opinion. They couldn't have turned this card in soon enough. I think they saw the Bucks, the Redskins, the Packers. I don't think they thought there was a chance in hell that all three of those teams would pass on James. This was their biggest need was safety and just perfect. He is my pick for defensive player of the year. And I already said that I'm picking the Chargers to win the AFC next year. I wish they had a home field advantage to back me up there, but I, I see their roster as the best roster in the AFC. And frankly, it's not even that close. I'm sorry, Patriots. I know you have Tom Brady, but your defense isn't even close to this Chargers defense. And frankly, your offense isn't that far ahead of the Chargers, if ahead at all. Uh, so they need to get that crowd rocking in that soccer stadium for this last year, I think. Um, but man, this team is exciting. I cannot wait to watch this Chargers team. They also need to figure out how to close games at the end, um, but I think they can get there. And then at 216, they take a linebacker here out of USC. I like the scheme fit a lot. I was a little worried that someone was gonna take him and try to make him an edge rusher. That's not the case here. Uh, he's gonna come in and be the outside linebacker, sort of the Anthony Barr role. I know I use that a lot, but a lot of these 4-3 teams are looking for that kind of good pass rushing stand-up linebacker who can blitz and be good in coverage as well. That's definitely what they got in in Wosu here. Justin Jones, I had this as a reach. Uh, it's an, you know I've, I've talked a good chunk about that NC State D-line, how none of the guys outside of Chubb really stood out to me. Um, but Jones, a good athlete. They needed a, an interior guy to help there. Uh, so they may have gotten that there. And then Kaiser White, I like this pick a good bit. Uh, they're apparently going to play him at linebacker. I have some questions about that. Um, but really good, strong safety. I don't think he is that far off of a prospect of Carl Joseph, who this uh, division rival here took the Raiders in the first round a few years ago. Pretty similar prospect, in my opinion. Uh, there's a there's a chance that James and White are just the starting safeties here. I don't think either of them are best used as center fielder types, though. And then they take a backup center and Kesenberry. They signed Mike Pouncey, but he's got injury questions. So we could see Kesenberry starting at center this year especially given the Chargers' injury history. Uh, knock on wood for my AFC champion prediction there. But uh, uh, Dylan Cantrell here, I could see him playing tight end for this team. Uh, they have a pretty good group of receivers. He's about 6'3", 230 almost. So, you know, he could actually play a lot of that slot receiver tight end. He's a good run blocker. He's got really good hands. And then Justin Jackson, great great pick here. I love Justin Jackson. I actually had him ranked just above both Ronald Jones and Sony Michelle. Super versatile guy. I think he could make an impact on third down, uh, but also be a three down reliever here if anything were to happen to Melvin Gordon. I actually added Justin Jackson at the end of my dynasty draft where I have Melvin Gordon. I could not be any happier about it. So really good draft. The Chargers really kind of <laughs> pivots around that Derwin James pick, but they, they had some good picks along the rest of the draft as well. They didn't have a lot of big needs either. And then the Chiefs, kind of an uneventful draft here. But again, you know, this is probably a C-plus grade, but if Pat Mahomes pans out, A-plus, doesn't matter. Um, and I actually think that could happen. I, I like the direction they're doing, uh, they're going with, with Pat Mahomes. Uh, they take Breland Speaks, who was a bit of a reach for me, but I like it. Reminds me a bit of the Chris Jones pick, uh, more of a, a guy who didn't always kill it in college, but... A definitely athletic upside and he could very well come in and start right away as the three four end here he played a lot of edge at Ole Miss but it's going to convert to D end here so a good pick there they take a nose tackle and Derek Nadi and then Dorian O'Daniel one of my favorite players in the class uh, Chiefs have some good run defending linebackers here with Ragland and Hitchens but now they got a good cover guy there to help out Armani Watts playmaking safety out of Texas A&M Traymond Smith and another D lineman here. So this team clearly wants to improve the beef up front. Uh, did a pretty good job addressing that. It wasn't the deepest D line class by any standards, if you ask me. Uh, so I think they got some pretty decent value there, all things considered. So uh, B minus for the Chiefs. And then 
kind of saving one of the more enticing boomer bust drafts here for last. The Raiders, uh, Chucky's first draft here. A lot of risk. <laughs> um, I just gave it a B because it is more than any of these classes. I've talked about how, you know, there's no way to truly say which of these players are going to be studs and duds. I can only try and project. But when you take as many risks as this Raiders team did, it is literally impossible for me to tell you how this draft is going to turn out. Almost every pick they took, uh, not almost, every single pick outside of Marcel Aitman in the seventh is a risk. So you take Colton Miller, who's a raw tackle, did a good job pr protecting uh, Rosen there at UCLA, but by all accounts, he might not be ready to start right away. He's got athletic upside. I uh, gave it a B because of the really lack of depth at tackle. Colton Miller was definitely the second best tackle in this class. They wanted McGlinchey at 10. They don't get him, so they move down. Could have gotten more for moving down, by the way. Um, so this pick, a lot of Raiders fans hated. Honestly, tackle is so underrated. You got to give your chance. You got to give yourself any chance you can get at a good tackle, and they did that. P.J. Hall, I didn't have him on my draft board. I totally slept on P.J. Hall, uh, but obviously he goes in the second round. I have to do my research after the draft. I love him. Uh, he's definitely got some risk, played at a smaller school, Sam Houston, I think, uh, but he blocked like 13 kicks, super freaky athlete, like an Aaron Donald type of athlete. He's got that undersized D tackle mold that I just get a big smile on my face when I see those little bowling balls, your Mike Daniels and Grady Jarrett types. He definitely fits the Grady Jarrett mold. I think he's gonna be pretty good for this D line that needs some talent and really just a defense that needs a better pass rush all around to help out uh, Khalil Mack. Uh, and then they take Brandon Parker, who I honestly probably would have liked this pick better if they didn't already take a huge project in Colton Miller. I'd probably rather go the other way and go with like uh, Tyrell Crosby out of Oregon and, and at least get a guy who you know can play right away. Uh, so really all risk so far. Then they take Arden Key, who yes, I had a first round grade on, but these teams clearly did not like what they saw as far as his personality. That, that was the question for me was his work ethic. His weight's been all over the place in college. He's inconsistent, but he has all the upside in the world. So Chucky thinks he can take him and turn him into uh, the compliment to Khalil Mack on the opposite side. There's a lot of upside there, um, but a lot of signs seem to be pointing towards him just kind of flaming out, not being that good. We'll see how that plays out. And then Nick Nelson coming off the injury, not so much risk there. I think he'll be fine. I really like Nick Nelson's game, and I gave it an A. I thought this was an excellent pick, probably their best, safest pick here. Maurice Hurst, you know, this this is a just boomer bust pick. He was a top 11 or 12 prospect for me. I love Maurice Hurst so much. I'll be cheering for the hell out of him. Um, but there's clearly some risk here that he might not even be able to play. So if, if he can play, if he's healthy, man, what a freaking steal. Uh, to pair Hurst, who's just shy of Aaron Donald coming out, in my opinion, uh, with Khalil Mack, that could be terrifying. And, you know, their season could take a dynamic swing if Maurice Hurst can be good. But, you know, Vegas only has this team at, I think, eight wins right now. That kind of tells me that Vegas doesn't think Hurst is going to play. We'll see how that all plays out. I'll be cheering for him. And they take a punter in the fifth. And then Azeem Victor, who I actually had on my do not draft list. He's got off the field issues. And I basically wrote, if he has a freak workout, I'd give him a chance. His tape's just fine, uh, but he didn't. He didn't have a freak workout. He's been arrested in college. I just don't see the point in bringing this player into your locker room personally. I just don't see the, the upside for Azeem Victor for a potential locker room headache. There's other linebackers that were just as good, if not better. Um, so I didn't love that pick, but it is late. Doesn't really matter. And then Marcel Aitman, great pick here. You know, I think he could be a bigger Marvin Jones. Really good at the point of the catch. Definitely benefited from playing uh, on the team and the system he did, but definitely gives them a replacement for Michael Crabtree. And frankly, a play that I think has a higher ceiling than Michael Crabtree as sort of that jump ball guy that Derek Carr loves to have. Uh, so a boomer bust draft for the Raiders. I just gave it a B because I have no idea. This could turn out to be a historic draft class or historically bad, depending on which way all of the pendulums swing. Uh, so I know that was long, but I wanted to get that done. Uh, the draft season's over. I'm excited to moving on to some new content here. I'm gonna take a little break. 
Might not get uh, too many videos in the next, you know, seven to 10 days, but definitely expect a pickup with deep dives and franchise rebuilds. Like the video if you enjoyed, guys. Check out my Patreon. Cheers, as always. We'll see you soon.